he doesn't care about democracy. Come to me as long as you want to be with me, I have the carrot. But if you don't want to be with me, I have the stick. Hey guys, welcome back to the Are We OK podcast, the podcast that talks about politics and public policies in ways that are relevant to you, the man, the woman, the child on the street, and wherever we find you listening to our podcast. My name is Ken Ming or Dr. OKM or Dr. Bota, and we have... This is Mr. Money, Peter. And we have a special guest today with us, all the way from Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Jayadi Hanan, he is the head of the political science department at the International Islamic University in Indonesia, or they call it U-triple-I, or U-tiga-I. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. U-I-I-I. U-I-I-I. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Jayadi, or you, your friend... I, I go by Jay, yeah. Okay, Jay, mm-hmm. welcome to Are We OK podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, welcome here to Malaysia. Thank you. You want to... Thank you, and I am okay. You are okay. (laughs) We are all okay today. All okay. uh, And uh, hopefully we can be more okay in 2025. Tapi, maybe you want to um, introduce yourself and let the audience know a little bit more about, you know, where you come from, where you studied and what you're doing now. Yeah, I am Jayadi Hanan. Uh, friends can call me Jay. I am now, uh, the, as, as you said, the head of the PhD program of inter, uh, uh, political science at the Indonesian UIA. You know UIA in Malaysia, so I would call it Indonesian UIA. But this is a government university, just operated for around four years now, so we are new. And I am also the executive director of Indonesian Survey Institute, or LSI, the oldest a pollster in Indonesia, if you will. So we do a lot of pollings during the elections and also outside of the elections. We do academic pollings as well as political pollings and other kind of uh, pollings also. I guess then then it's a good place to maybe for everyone to just start with this very simple question. What's the difference between Malaysia politics and Indonesia politics? Because mainly today, that's what we're going to go into, right? Let's start with two very basic differences. Yeah? One is on the uh, governmental system. Indonesia is multi-party presidential system, while Malaysia is a parliamentary system, multi-party parliamentary system. So differences, but also there are similarities there, right? The similarities on multi-party. Yes. So you have a lot of parties in the parliament, we also have a lot of parties. That is the very basic difference. The other basic difference is that your country, Malaysia, is federal country. Mm. Ours is unitary country. Meaning that in Malaysia, correct me if I'm wrong, the power is basically in the hands of the state. That's the case for most federal systems. Yeah. Yeah. But But for Malaysia... It's a bit different, uh, yeah? A bit different. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. uh, Yeah. But in in Indonesia, (laughs) the the power is all uh, owned by Jakarta. Then, Mm. but... Provinsi also wants to... Right. But now, because uh, Indonesia Indonesia is very big, very diverse, so it cannot be managed all by Jakarta. So we have the thing called... The policy called decentralization. So, meaning that uh, the provincial government and also the government below the province can have some autonomy in managing their own internal affairs, except for several issues like foreign policies, defense. finance issue, defense, hmm. uh, religious issues. They are all uh, justice, yeah, or, and law. They are all managed directly by the central government hmm. in, in Jakarta. So From there comes some uh, some interesting or some controversial issues in terms of the relationship between the central government and the provincial government, central government and lower level government from uh, of the provinces. On that note, uh, yeah. maybe our audience may not realize there's two other differences that are part of this landscape, which is uh, in Indonesia, you have a lot more elections at the local level. And then the other thing is that your equivalent of the upper house that's also yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. elected. Right, you right, want to say right. a bit more yeah. about that? We have a kind of, what is it, bicameral Bicameral, parliament, bicameral parliament. Mm. The lower house is called the national, uh, the DPR, the one perwakilan rakyat, or Mm. the people, yeah, like MP here. Mm. But starting from 2002 or 2004, we have also the kind of Senate, Mm. the uh, the, the upper house, the DPD, Mm. the uh, the one perwakilan daerah or regional representative uh, council. However, the Senate is not as strong as the Senate in the US Mm. because this DPD has only advisory power. Mm. They Mm. can have a policy, but their policy should be an advice to the lower house. Mm. So basically, it doesn't have power. 
So DPR is where all the action is. Yes. So politically speaking, if we are we are looking at the power, Indonesia is actually monocameral, but U- unicameral, not monocameral. Uh, unicameral, but I think in some some ways, some of the local governments, uh, in, and we'll talk about this later when we mm-hmm. talk about the regional elections okay. uh, in Jakarta yeah, yeah. and other mm-hmm. places. Those yeah, yeah. They have. A yeah. Uh, as I said, we have the so-called the policy of decentralization or regional autonomy policies. Part of the decentralization is on political decentralization, and the one example of political decentralization is local elections. So we have local elections for governors at the provincial level, and then we also have local elections for mayors and regions oh. at the level of below provincial government. So we have more than 514 local elections for mayor and regions. Wow. And we have 37 uh, local elections for governors. Actually, we have 38 provinces. But one province does not have election for governors because the governor is automatically the sultan. Oh, this is a uh, Jogja. Jogjakarta. Yes. Yeah. Oh. So we have for for so for instance, the coming on this coming 27 of November, we will have simultaneous regional, regional elections. So we will elect 37 governors and then more than 514 uh, mayors and regions at the, le- the level of below uh, provincial level, and. In each of these province and uh, munip- municipalities and regencies, they also have local council or, or the kabupa- at the kabupaten and kota level, they have uh, DPRD, the one perwakilan rakyat daerah, or let's say local council yeah. or local house, and also at the provincial level. But these local house uh, members are elected simultaneously with the national house uh, the national legislative members ah, which okay. was done in february 2024 right. yes when the presidential Kanalawa. elections Adun yeah and yes. right 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 you get a flavor of the vibrancy of the democracy in indonesia yeah, right. yeah. and we'll come back to that when we talk and about the election is very big very big thing in indonesia it's very you know the sheer number is very big for instance there are uh, one presidency right one president one vice president There are 500, 580 lo- uh, House of Representative members, 152 Senate members, yes. and almost 20,000 local okay. council yes. members. Mm. And this election is involving more than 200 million eligible voters. And our eligible voters will cast their ballot in the polling station, right? And in the last election, our polling stations consist of 820,000 something. Each of the polling station is managed by seven local officials. Hmm. You can imagine more than 800,000 polling station times seven, meaning that almost six million six people million. is needed yes. Yes. to only manage our polling station. Only yeah. polling station, yeah. not the upper... Uh, Uh, administrative uh, yes. thing. Mm. So let's say how many Singaporeans there? There are around 5.6 mm, yeah, million. Yeah, about six million. <laughs> yes. So if we import all of the Singaporeans, it is still not enough to manage our polling stations. And I think because of the scale of this, uh, if I'm not mistaken, after India, uh, Indonesia yeah, will be the second, the second largest, largest oh, democracy. Right. And yeah. it is in only w- the election is conducted in only one day, hmm. not in l- not even one day, from seven o'clock to eleven to one o'clock. Hmm. From 11 o'clock to 13, hmm. meaning only seven, oh. seven hours. Yeah, Everything must be done. Logistical nightmare, man. Hmm. Yes, but they managed to. Efficiency. You know, they managed the na- to do it very well. Yeah. The number of ballots is more than one. One, one billion. One billion. Yes. Mm. Everything added together. Right. Just a very quick one as we uh, dive into the the part where mm. we talk about the politics and stuff like that. So, Ken Ming, on your perspective. As a Malaysian comparative uh, political scientist, mm. uh, what would you see the difference are? Well, I would say that after the 1998 Asian financial crisis uh, that came about together with a political crisis in many parts of Southeast Asia, Indonesia emerged as I think one of the most robust uh, democracies in Southeast Asia. The decentralization is something that you saw uh, after 1998, and at the same time, if I'm not mistaken, during that stretch, there were I think. Four constitutional uh, Amendment. amendments yes. that were very major, and I knew this because I was doing some research for my PhD advisor at that time, uh, Professor Donald Horowitz, who's oh. uh, written some oh. books on this as well. Oh, Duke University. Yes, at Duke, ah. Duke University. Yes. So I looked at some of the election results as well. That's so you that's very very big name in political science. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, study under Don. You could see that the kind of uh, changes 
that have been put in place are very, very difficult to, to reverse. Uh, and that's why Indonesia has such a vibrant uh, democracy. But of course, with a vibrant democracy, it also means that it is uh, messier mm. uh, to manage, uh, especially when it comes to pushing through economic development policies, which we'll talk about after this as mm -hmm. well. So we'll take a short break and then we'll come back and talk about uh, President Jokowi before we go into the discussion on the new president, President Prabowo. Be right back. Welcome back to the Are We OK podcast with our special guest, uh, Dr. Jayadi Hanan from UEEE. Or, or Jay. Or Jay. We'll call him Jay uh, for the purposes of this podcast. And let's dive straight into uh, discussing the legacy of the outgoing uh, president, uh, President uh, Joko Widodo or President Jokowi as he is uh, popularly yeah. known. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he did a lot of things, uh, including mm -hmm. putting Indonesia back on a path of economic and political stability. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And also, you know, he governed over a very diverse coalition, uh, bringing in uh, political parties from different stripes, mm -hmm. uh, including some of his rivals. In the second term. Yes, in the second term. So. How, how would you describe his legacy from the perspective of a political scientist? Well, in general, we can characterize both negative and positive sure. uh, legacies, right? Yes. Take uh, the first one, uh, infrastructure development. You know, infrastructure development is one of the most appreciated jobs or policies, Joko Widodo. And for the first time in history, Indonesia much, much uh, better connected because of that infrastructure development. By infrastructure development, I mean, I mean is uh, the, uh, you know, toll roads. Roads, railways. Uh, railways, uh, not airports. so much railways, airport, and then seaport, and so on and so forth. For example, uh, let me give you an example. From the very southern part of Sumatra, Lampung, to the ancient kingdom of Sriwijaya capital, mm. Palembang. Palembang. Usually, before Jokowi, uh, it took around 13 hours drive. Mm. Very, very, very... Yes, bad roads. Very messy, mm. bad roads, and so on and so forth. But now, it takes only around three and a half hours. If you're a normal driver. Wow. If you're a fast driver, it mm. can take up to two and a half or three hours. Oh, wow. You wow. see? That's wow. a big difference. Yeah. So, usually, it, uh, 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 if we're taking land, it will take almost two days to travel from Jakarta to Palembang, mm. my, my own my, my home city. Mm. But now it takes only eight to nine hours. Oh. Uh, nine hours because including of the ferry. Including the ferry. Wow. So the ferry usually take more more time. So that is uh, an, an 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 example, and also other 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 types of uh, infrastructures. And development. we hear about the high speed rail as well. High speed rail also, but it is only one so yeah. far, only from Bandung and Jakarta, Jakarta uh, and return. So, but to, to give you il illustrations that usually by land we can, uh, or by ordinary, ca ordinary train, it takes around three and a half hours to go to Bandung from Jakarta uh, or the other way around also takes around five, four to five hours uh, driving, but now only 32 minutes. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I thought it was one hour, but it's now 32, no, 32 minutes. minutes. So wow. you, just, you just get in, sit, and then suddenly you are You're in there already. Oh, oh right? wow. That's fast. Yeah, that is uh, one example. So again, in short, infrastructure development is the most appreci uh, appreciated. And, and that was helped also because he managed to pass this uh, omnibus? Uh, no, it act? is before. Oh, before. Omnibus okay. is only in his second term. Ah, okay. So most of the infrastructure project has been started since the first term. So, uh, yeah, part of the reason is I think his focus, yeah. He focused very much on the physical uh, development, but in this case, the infrastructure development for, uh, I think, for a uh, uh, right reason, because you cannot develop your economy, you cannot develop your human resources That's right, uh, without, and so on, without That's right. being interconnected. And infrastructure is one of the, cru the most crucial thing in, in, in Indonesia because of, yeah, these are an island countries consisting of very diverse uh, societies and also uh, uh, very diverse geographical locations and so on and so forth. So infrastructures is one of the most important thing. Yeah, we always hear 13,000 islands in Indonesia. That's right, you know, No, actually 17,000. Plus, plus minus, depending on whether it's high tide yeah. or low tide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we ha I think officially we have 17,000. 17,000, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not including the one in uh, South China Sea. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that was always sensitive. Yes, that was a bit sensitive. Yeah, sensitive. yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, I think around 2,000 are inhabited. Wow. Uh, others are not inhabited. Therefore, some are 
lost <laughs> taken by some <laughs> some, some, uh, some people yeah some people, yes. uh, okay so on the infrastructure there is a negative side specifically on uh, you know it the new capital of Nusantara ah, right ah okay, okay it was a pet it, project of Jokowi yeah mm. this is like a we call it mercusuar like a like a mm, like a iconic iconic of, uh, yeah yes. yeah mm. so he, actually the ambition to move Indonesian capital from Jakarta to somewhere like in Kalimantan or somewhere else has been the obsession of many presidents from oh. even from Soekarno right Soekarno even has plan to uh, move the capital into Kalimantan mm. actually so Jokowi is basically following the step of Soekarno to move the capital into Kalimantan but he managed to execute it to execute it mm. although can be executed only around 10 to 15 percent mm. by his own confession yes. he declared right mm. that by 2024 by the uh, celebrations of Indonesian Independence Day of 17 of August 2024 the capital the new capital can only be executed only around 15% at the most mm. but he had a cabinet meeting there before he uh, yeah. he stepped down yeah so of course but it is, yeah it is only symbolic <laughs> yeah. but not functional yet until today sure one of the big problem is the money ah yes yeah. funding yes yeah the money it is not easy right the funding I don't know. Uh, yeah. Like for it, us, Putrajaya was funded by Petronas. So see, <laughs> yeah. Initially, uh, Jokowi planned to have that kind of, you know, cooperation between the government and business. But what kind of business person would like to invest in that kind of empty place, right? Correct. They mm. don't know when their uh, investment will come back, when re- will return, and so on and so forth. Yeah. It it ended up with the government are trying to execute the project itself. Mm. That's number one. The money. Number two is the land. I don't think it's only in Indonesia. Yeah? Land acquisition mm. is also a problem in many Southeast Asian countries because usually land has been uh, what is it controlled by some you know tycoon, some uh, or local people, and so on yep. and so forth. It is very difficult to free the land for the development, mm. uh, particularly when you are dealing with big business you know, tycoons and also uh, including the local people. That's number two. Mm. The, pro- the other problem is on the issue of environment. Ah, okay. right. Yes. The environment, uh, environmental issue. It's all uh, uh, complicated. Added to that is the issue of you know culture. How do you preserve local culture when you open up an empty space where not really empty space actually there are people there. Do you just re- relocate them? How do you relocate them? What about their uh, what is it their, uh, their way of living, the way of living and so on and so forth their, their culture and so on and so forth. it's complicated therefore as you know that even Putrajaya is built not in one or two years right yeah yeah, yeah. it oh, took yeah. a long time took a long to time I heard I I visited the Sejong city administrative uh, capital in South Korea hmm. I was told there that uh, the the new capital was established since 2006 and until today it is not even a capital yet. Ah. It is only a capital, in only administrative city. Actually, the attempt to build a new capital has been had been tried by the former President Suharto. It was like Putrajaya, very close to Jakarta, Jakarta. but it was also failed. Yeah. So the second one, uh, why this issue is negative, because it is controversial. People in Kalimantan, the where the new city is located, going to be located, are happy with that, of course. But people in Jakarta not happy. People outside Jakarta they, they don't know why. <laughs> yeah. why is, what, what is the what What's is the what is rational? Yes, what is the right. benefit and so on and so forth? So it is negative. Uh, our survey told uh, our survey uh, reveals that when we ask people about do you agree with this project, people are polarized. 50, 50. 50, almost 50-50. Ah, okay. So those consider an infrastructure that mm. is negative. Yeah, and we'll come back to this when we talk about uh, Prabowo and what his mm. views are on this. But yeah, any any other positives or negatives? Now, the rest will be more negative. Okay. <laughs> when we are not talking about infrastructure and economy, say we are talking about democracy and governance in general. Number one, uh, there is a, a phenomenon called executive aggrandizement. Ah, okay. Executive aggrandizement. A- meaning yes. that the executive, the president, is getting more and more powerful, powerful. Mm. in politics and policy making to the extent that he can be considered like a king. Mm. Mm. Whatever he wants, there. So he can override a lot of right. uh, things. Uh, that's why they call him the king of Indonesia, right? Something right. Like that. So yeah. th- th- there is a phenomena called imperial presidency. 
in the US. Ah, okay, yes, yes. But this uh, refers to the phenomenon of a president, as, as I said, is trying to be dominant, hmm. Hmm. not become dominant. Trying to be dominant, like Donald Trump, you know, uh, George W. Bush, uh, and some other, uh, 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 what is it, um, Roosevelt, and so on and so forth. Uh, by using unilateral unilateral action, hmm. Exec- executive orders, oh, executive and orders, and so on and so forth. But in the U.S. context, it is vehemently re- uh, op- opposed by the opposition party, right? Mm, yeah. The But in Indonesian case, the president has no opposi- has very weak opposition, mm. particularly Jokowi. Mm. For instance, during in the last year of his reign, his uh, term, he has a coalition amounting to 91 percent of the seats in the parliament mm, oh. of the DPR. Yes. Yeah, of the DPR, 91 percent. So he has on so the formal of official opposition is only nine percent strong. How could you expect? Mm. So the president can get anything oh. he wants. So why why is that? Because number one, he try to include everybody in the coalition. He doesn't care about democracy. So big tent. Approach. Big tent. Come to me as long as you want to be with me. I have the carrot. But if you don't want to be with me, I have the stick. And you know, when you are a chairman of a political party, for instance, the president wants you to be included in his coalition. You said, no, I don't want to. Mm. But he said, but I can criminalize you. Mm-hmm. That's so very hard to say no. I can twist you. Mm. Twist make, your arm. make you an offer you cannot refuse. Right. So the other thing is like dirty democracy, dirty tactics, like uh, how he put his son into the ballot, for instance. Yeah. Mm. So this is uh, Gibran, who is now the Gibran, vice president. Gibran, yeah. Mm. Gibran was not eligible for uh, for the, for being in the ballot because he was too young. He's too young. Mm. Through his brother-in-law in the constitutional court, mm. they made the decision through MK MK ruling that put Gibran as the uh, as eligible to be. The vice presidential candidates. Mm. So and, and were certain laws also amended to allow that yes, to happen? Yes, mm. yes, yes. Mm. So in the middle of the process, mm. if it is not in the middle of process, it's okay, right? Mm. But the it's like you have been playing a soccer, mm. but suddenly the how about to change the rules? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then you maybe the goalposts become bigger, or smaller. Right. <laughs> 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 you see, uh, for instance. Uh, That's number one. Executive agreement. There are a lot on the, my list. Hmm. My list is long. Hmm. How okay, long okay. you want to go? Uh, maybe we stop at three. <laughs> oh, three. Okay. Yes. The second one is dynastic politics. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Why this is important? Because Jokowi was being uh, hailed by the public hmm. as a new hope in hmm. Indonesia. An outsider coming in. Outsider coming in. He did not care about family politics. He just care about Indonesian, you know, destiny, Indone- yeah, Indonesian people, and so on and so forth. He seemed to do that well in the first term. Mm. Second term. And second term, suddenly we know that he is just ordinary politician. Mm, okay, so he's not only does he put his son as a vice presidential candidate. Before I've he has put his son, his, his son mm. into the mayor. Mm, yes. By by circumventing other candidate who's supposed to be on that position. Mm. The other one is his son-in-law in mm. S- North Sumatra. Mm. In. Uh, Medan, in that? Medan, mm. who is also now the mayor. Of Medan, right, right. The mayor now running in probably a will be the governor mm. of, of uh, North, North Sumatra. Sumatra. So mm. the second one, mm. the third one, you know, one of the hope to Jokowi is that he would finish the effort of eradicating big corruption in Indonesia. He's good in the first year, uh, in the first term. Mm. But in the second term, suddenly he revised the law on corruption eradication commission, mm. which weakened. The power of the the commission, the commission, the commission of Pemberantasan Korupsi, Corruption mm. Eradication Commission. As a result, during the second term, our, for instance, corruption perception index is now uh, getting lower from around 40s in terms of the score to only 34. In 2019, it was 40. In 2024, it is only 34. Putting mm. Indonesia on the rank of 115 out of 180 countries. Mm. So Indonesia is now similar to. Philippines. Mm. So going down. Going down, mm. uh, corruption. So you know, corruption is a very big thing. Yes. Yeah, rasuah in your in your word. So those three things: uh, this kind of uh, executive aggrandizement. Second one is dynastic politics. Uh, we have a bit of that in Malaysia yeah. as well. <laughs> the And weakening of corruption eradication yes. commission. If All you right. want to uh, put mo- a lot more, you can. One more thing, for instance, the weakening of. The Indonesian Constitutional Court, mm, the judiciary, mm. judiciary, the yeah, judiciary, the highest, right? Uh, yeah. You know, this is one of the reason why there is the executive aggrandizement because 
executive aggrandizement can not cannot be done hmm. or cannot be cannot happen if there is check, uh, and, check and execute and and constraints on the executive right. one of the the most important constraint to the executive is from judiciary and now the judiciary which has been hailed by the public as very good after reformasi now also being weakened as a result the trust the public trust on this constitutional court is now you know very very low just like kpk hmm. so they are all putting indonesian government indonesian governance hmm. and indonesian democracy in a very difficult position so after you, jokowi on on this front uh, i'm i'm not sure whether you you find that maybe is somewhat encouraging uh, when there were attempts to try to change the electoral rules of who is who can be eligible to run for the governor <coughs> there were a lot of protests yeah. uh, and uh, hail hail back to the time of reformasi and yeah. all that and those uh, changes had to be yeah. uh, had to be cancelled yeah yeah on democracy thing uh, one one positive note is that you may call it a kind of democratic resilience from the public which is important which is very important so despite many efforts of the of uh, deteriorating democracy in Indonesia but Indonesian public still consider democracy as the best system yeah. therefore when there is when the the effort has been in the eyes of the public too much yeah. like what the the example that you mentioned then the public will go to the street protested and so on and so forth yeah. sometimes they that. they they are successful sometimes they fail yeah. the one that you mentioned was successful the but other the times b- when they have failed yeah. So. yeah yeah so Yeah, that is the the positive side, but it is not from Jokowi, right? Ah, uh, yes, it's not. It's not. It's it, it is more the public of the public. Yes, yeah. more so, of the public. So it is not his legacy. Let me put another positive side on ah, the economy. Okay. Eh? Okay, yes. As you mentioned, uh, Jokowi was able to manage a stable economy even during the COVID. The public understand that during the COVID, our economy was very negative. If we ask them, around 81 percent of them during the COVID said that Indonesian economy is bad, but uh, they still appreciate the president. Jokowi in this case with good approval rating part of the reason because he could manage to maintain the particularly the price of the goods nine basic goods in Indonesian terms sembilan bahan pokok like rice cooking oil uh, sugar and so on and so forth eggs yeah yeah why because in this case he managed to be able to provide to allocate the money to uh, the social assistance program direct cash transfers and other types of social assistance programs in education in uh, health and so on and so forth mm-hmm. therefore indonesian economy is stable until today from day one of jokowi's uh, uh, term and also now it is still grew at the level of 5% which is very good comparatively speaking so that is the other positive side if you want me to say Uh, positive I'll, I'll come one. back to the but economy. But of course, if you want me to say negative one, a lot. <laughs> I think quite a good balance already. Yeah. Peter, any any additional questions on Jokowi that you want to ask? I actually have two questions. Uh, I think number one will be, why is there this obsession of all these different presidents to want to move the capital city? Uh, from what I've read, generally, it's because they say Jakarta is sinking. But I think there has to be more than that as a reason, right? So that's number one. Number two is... Why do you think at second term suddenly there's such a big change mm-hmm. and in fact it go to the point that suddenly mm. he even brought in his up rival mm-hmm. as a defense minister and Lee literally Tong supported made it him like, yeah. supported him as president yeah. and then supported his president it's it, it mm. for me it's a bit out of the mind it's kind of like uh, our pm mm. Anwar Ibrahim in the next election suddenly hail muhyiddin as the next yeah. <laughs> right mm-hmm. so he just went totally like different right so These are my two main questions. Thank you, Peter. The, the first question can be answered by, by at least three things. One is that uh, it, it is a symbol of the nation. So n- capital is the symbol of the nations. So it is a symbol of uni- u- uh, u- 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 unity mm-hmm. of Indonesia. Jakarta is located in the western part of Indonesia and only in Java. That is one of the uh, normative reasons. So because Indonesia is so vast, diverse, very big, so we need to put a capital some sometimes like, you know, in the middle of the country to decrease the the perception that this is a Javanese Yes, government. Javanese Javanese government and so on. Mm-hmm. So that is I think uh, reason number one, which can be elaborated uh, further. Number two is the uh, the issue of related to uh, the government or governance, managing the countries. So uh, it is a symbol of more even uh, development. So as uh, Kian Ming mentioned, 
that if you put uh, the capital in ja- in Jakarta or in Java, there is a tendency of the perception at least that Indonesia is Java centric, right? Mm. In fact, if you look at the economy, about 70 to 75 percent of the whole the money is circulated in Jakarta. Mm, Jakarta. Yes. And out of that 25 percent remaining, around 80 percent of them is circulated only in Java. So the rest of the country got very little. Uh, very little. Very little While in fact, the source of the money for for Jakarta for the for the national budget, for instance, from mining. Where is the mining? It is not outside. in Java. Mm. Outside, of, like in Aceh, Papua, uh, Molucas, Maluku, Sulawesi, and so on and so forth. Mm. And so your petroleum resources. Petroleum resource. So right. so putting putting uh, capital at the center of the country will be symbolically driving the possible more even distribution, uh, distribution of, of economic and also develop. That's number two. Number three, objective reason, as you said, Jakarta is sinking. It is no longer able to to bear the burden. 30 million people. <laughs> Now, Jakarta is, during the day, around 13 to 15 million, hmm. if I'm not mistaken. During the night time, around 9 million. Oh, Depends okay, on okay. the time. I make a living in Jakarta, hmm. but I live outside Jakarta, for instance. Hmm. Therefore, the greater ja- uh, if you count the greater Jakarta, it can be around 30 million. Yeah? Hmm. But Jakarta only, during the daytime, is around 13, maybe to 14. But during the night time is around nine. So those three reasons, I think, can answer your your very important questions. Mm. The second question is related to why in the second term. Mm. You know, when in, in the first term you want to, you need to please the voters, right? Mm. Because you want to be re-elected. Mm. Second term you have no, no more constraints. Right. <laughs> second term you have no more constraints. You can pursue anything you want. Like Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is a very simple answer to that. Which is which applies to any politicians in yeah. every uh, country. Every history also has a right. similar character. S- right. Mm. Yeah. Well, in in uh, Malaysia, parliamentary democracy is there's no term limits, <coughs> so you can actually go on for a much longer yeah, time. We, we have seen yeah. one who sat for very many years. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, a prime minister. Has a very similar development of story. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also, also came back for a second time. <laughs> right. Yeah. But anyway, right. uh, yeah. So. Um, you know, with those two questions, maybe I want to f- wrap up this episode on Jokowi by asking you this question. <coughs> what is next for him? Because he doesn't have a political party. He's left PDIP. Mm. And there's this uh, lot of speculation about him perhaps wanting to form his own political party, perhaps wanting to take over right. control of uh, an existing <coughs> party. W- what is your best guess? <laughs> It seems that he likes the power. Mm. <laughs> Just like everybody, yeah? Mm. You politician, you know what how how nice being in power is, right? Yes, correct. I right. can I can say so, that it's very so. So it is not normal if politician does want do, doesn't want to be staying in power, right? Uh, yes, Jokowi I, is yeah. just normal politicians. He wants to stay in power. In fact, he tried to get the third term, right? Mm, yes, he tried to get the, th- the third term. Too much uh, negative uh, public reaction. But public reaction and also at the political actors mm. do not like it, right? Did not like it mm. because if Jokowi is in power again. Somebody else cannot. Yeah, somebody else cannot, like Prabowo, hmm. for instance. So, so in fact, he he he. Uh, he uh, w- what I'm telling you is that he is really wanting to be staying in power. Hmm. If not directly, why not indirectly, right? Hmm. Okay. Now, as you said, what is his in- political instrument to be staying in power after the presidency? Hmm. Let's see what is his political asset. His biggest political asset during the presidency is two things. One is his popularity. Mm. He's very popular. People like him. Uh, very good with uh, lower level people mm. and so on and so forth. And Pop- he was able to translate that into support for Prabowo. Exactly. And then number two is his position as a president, right? Yes, Indonesia is a democratic country, but democratic country in Southeast Asia. Mm. Yes. So uh, being a president, you have not only political power, mm. but you have also policy making power. Mm. So. You have all things that can be appreciated by your political opponent mm. so that to, to put you into the advantage mm. in political competition. Mm. Okay. And also fundraising and yeah, things like all, that. Yeah, all things like that. Mm. Now, he is no longer in power, mm. right? So he lost those two political instruments. Mm. The former president, Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, SBY, yes. was, uh, is until now still relevant. Mm. Th- the reason is only one. He has political party, mm. which is controlled by himself. Mm. Megawati, mm. Megawati, the PDIP. former president, he has he he controlled the political party. Jokowi, as you said, 
does not have any political party to be important political instrument for him to be staying or to be relevant hmm. politically. Hmm. Okay, now you can imagine. Uh, wait a minute, he has Gibran, his <laughs> son, right? Hmm. His son. Remember, yes, but the power of Gibran is a vice president, a spare tire, right? Hmm. Uh, whether or not he will play any role. It will de- it will be very much depending on the president, yes. Prabowo. What Prabowo allows him to do. T- true, hmm. and that's number one. Maybe p- let's say Prabowo is very very you know very kind. Hmm. He want to return the favor for quite long time, so he will. Uh, he knows Jokowi wants Gibran to be having important role. Then maybe Prabowo will give him important role as the vice president. Hmm. But in government, it is not only the president. Who has the interest, right? Mm. Remember other political parties. Yes, mm. correct. And if you, let's say you don't have that base, you don't have, you don't control the political party or a political party of a movement, then your value at that point in time right. will be less. People also thinking about 2029 mm. election. Let's say Prabowo cannot be defeated by this member of coalition of political parties. What they want to be? At least vice president, right? Mm. So there is in the interest of other political parties who are the members of political coalition of Prabowo mm. to make Gibran weak. not having yeah, weak, mm. not having good important roles. Mm. Maybe you you can ask, ah, wh- what about the role of Gibran as managing some part of the ministries mm. and, the and portfolio. so forth? Mm. The portfolio. Maybe that like like Yusuf Kala. Mm. The, the former president during Yudhoyono and Jokowi. He plays very important role mm. in managing some ministries. Yeah, he was a foreign minister. Right, yeah. right, economic and so on and so forth. Remember, Prabowo has seven coordinating ministers. Mm. All of these seven coordinating ministers will be playing a coordinating role. Mm. Powerful for roles. Powerful role for the ministries. Mm. Almost all of them are the chair of political parties. Mm. So they are much more powerful politically than Gibran. And more senior also. Yeah. So I think uh, putting uh, Gibran as a political instrument of Jokowi also mm. will be not very significant. Mm. At least after two years. Why after two years? I think in one or two years from now, Prabowo will return the paper mm. to Jokowi. Mm. Because he knows that he was assisted by Jokowi to win the presidency. So I think he will give Jokowi's role directly or via uh, Gibran. Mm. I, in other words, Jokowi's political relevance is really depending on Prabowo's, uh, uh, Prabowo's willing. So, in other words, we can say that well, that is the law, of, uh, the law of politics, right? Mm. That peop, uh, the president comes and go. Yes. Right? So it will be interesting to watch this space to see what moves, further moves, uh, Jokowi and also his family will make, mm-hmm. uh, and also the response uh, to these moves by the powers that be, including President Prabowo. So we'll be right back and we'll come back and talk about President pa- Prabowo's priorities and also his cabinet. Be right back. Welcome back to the Are We OK podcast with our special guest, uh, Dr. Jayadi. Hanan, or otherwise known as Jay. Jay, we talked a lot about Jokowi and his uh, future moves, uh, but you know, how about what you evaluate in the short time that President Prabowo has been in power? And I specifically want to draw you to his cabinet first mm-hmm, before we mm-hmm. talk about his yeah. other priorities. Uh, you know, coming from Malaysia, we have a lot of people complaining about our cabinet being very big and mm. uh, being uh, a bit bloated and all that. But in the case of uh, Indonesia, although yes, bigger population, but you have uh, seven coordinating ministers, and mm-hmm. maybe you want to explain that to us. Uh, 48 ministers, 56 deputy ministers, uh, five uh, heads of uh, agencies that have a ministerial status. So the entire cabinet more is than 100. More than 100. <laughs> yes. So can you maybe unpack and yeah. explain this to us? Okay. okay. Well, first of all, um, it is easier to talk about Jokowi, right? Uh, because it's been in the past. Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah, you, we are comparative politics are very, very good in explaining the past. The past, correct. Yeah. But when talking about the future, we are a bit, you know, wishy washy. I'm sure you won't be uh, in this particular <laughs> case. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay. And uh, I think Prabowo believes that uh, economy is key. And of course, as he also uh, uh, said in many occasions, uh, other than economy, what we need to develop is defense because those two things create a fundamental, uh, what is it, fundamental structure of having a strong nation. Mm. 
Okay, but let's say it should be started with the economy, right? To have a good economy, you need he. I think he believes that we need political stability, mm. and he has. I think this is his most uh, one of his most important concern from day one is to create uh, a political stability that can guarantee the development that he plan mm. to do. What he has done so far is that number one is to uh, assemble a coalitions, mm. right? So these coalitions seems to me that he wanted a coalition as broad as possible. Mm. I think he number one. I think he learned from Jokowi. Second term, yes. In the second term, number two. I think it is also his own belief as an Indonesian, regardless of the negative or positive thing about that. He managed to assemble. A very large coalition. If we uh, consider PDIP, Megawati's party. Megawati's party as an opposition, although they did not, not they do not clearly uh, state it yet, then the power of, the, uh, of this political coalition has been around 81 percent. So it is no longer oversized coalition; it is supersized, mm, mm, right? Mm, supersized. Very strong. Meaning that uh, the, we are talking about the f- w- when we are talking about coalitions, there are at least two kind of coalitions, right? The floor coalitions mm. and the portfolio coalitions. Mm, yep. What you ask me is about portfolio coalition, but yes. I started the answer by using the floor, floor coalition. Yes, yeah? that means the, the DPR composition. Yeah, the DPR yes. composition. So he now has secured the su- the political support in the DPR or in the parliament. Mm. But that you you get that through portfolio also, right? You yeah. You then uh, to 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 uh, to maintain that kind of coalition, of course, you need to reflect that into the portfolio coalition. Interestingly, in Indonesia, Indonesian coalition, portfolio coalition does not necessarily reflect the size of or the number of parties included in the floor coalitions. Mm-hmm. If you count in his 100 and something ministers and vice ministers and post uh, at the level of ministries you see only around 50% more or less mm. of those people at least officially affiliated to political parties many of them around 50% are not at least officially affiliated to political parties so he has broad coalition in 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 the floor now in portfolio he has every political parties representative but the total number is not uh, equal to the whole number. Why, why is that the case? Because he, uh, just like other president, he tried to, to build even broader coalition, not only with political parties, but also with the people, with the, with the group I call public, so public coalitions. So in these coalitions, you have the so-called professionals, mm-hmm. like Sri Mulyani. Yeah, the, the finance minister. The finance minister. Mm-hmm. You have the representative of, I, um, most important Islamic groups, Muhammadiyah and NU. Yeah. You have yeah. also representative from women groups. Mm. You have representative from Western part of Indonesia, mm. like Aceh. You have representative from Eastern part of Indonesia, like uh, Papua. Mm. And then you also have the representative youth, mm. which which is not part of the political parties, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine this is a very broad coalition. Right. So. What you mean is that under the portfolio, 50% of the ministers are actually from a political party and the other 50% are not even politicians to start with. Yeah. They are Remember, NGO leaders yeah. or business owners yeah. or something like that. That, that, is, that is the different, one of the different natures or characteristics of presidential system coalition. Versus parliamentary. Versus parliamentary system. Mm. So, so... You see, uh, we we can uh, take uh, we can talk a lot about the differences. So now, uh, why it is so many? That is the answer. Mm. One of the answer. He wants to include everybody. Why? The concern is, he is thinking that everybody should be in his government, so that no one is left out. Left out. Mm. So everybody will go the s- the right way, mm. Mm. Or the same way. You know, so therefore, in his first speech, remember, uh, after ina- being inaugurated, he said, "It is time for us to be united." When uh, we, when we were in election for competition, we we competed very harshly, very vehemently. But after that, we have to be united. Therefore, we need to to defend, to develop our democracy. But democracy that we want to develop is democracy based on our own culture. So you see. There is some negative aspect on that from a democratic perspective. Very but interesting choice of words. Right. Mm. But uh, again, 
I think uh, to your question, the point, the first point is that he want to include everybody so that it can create a b- very good political stability. That is, uh, I think, what in what is in his thinking. Now, number two, the official reason given to the public via the media is that for efficiency, right? So, you know, this number of ministries is unprecedented. The the highest number we got is 34. Because uh, before uh, Prabowo, there, were, there there was a cap for the number of the ministries can be the size of the cabinet can be made by the president, which is 34 ministries. Mm. But now that law has been removed. Mm. It up to the president. If the president think 1,000 ministers is okay, then he will make it. Now, what is the official reason of having this? The so-called efficiency. Let's say we have the so-called long-term development planning, and according to Prabowo's team, this long-term development planning consisting of seven clusters of development, mm. which is reflected in that seven, seven coordinating ministry, ministers, right. menteri coordinator. coordinator. Okay, then each of these seven coordinator minister will coordinate several ministers. The other thing is that some ministries which was traditionally been there since uh, reformasi like ministry of education uh, has too much things to to deal with. Mm. They a need lot, to be a lot of administrative issues. Yeah, so needs to be divided into several ministries. Uh, as a result, the ministry of education now become three ministries. Uh-huh. Ministry of Education, uh, Ministry of uh, Higher Education, ha- Higher Education and Science, Ministry of uh, what is elementary and what is it called? Primary, Pri- uh, primary and secondary education, and then Ministry of Culture, for instance. Mm. Yeah. So those efficiency issues, I think, one of the the reason. Do you believe that? Do you right? I was going to ask you. Do you, Do you think that that is a valid argument to say that mm. having more ministers and ministries would we'll make it more efficient? Yeah. yeah. Th- that is against the theory of management, right? <laughs> <laughs> in some sense, yeah. In some sense, yes. Uh. W- when you are you, when you are developing the structure, making it much more larger or higher, that means you are expanding the level of control mm. or the level of coordination. Com- yeah, complexity. Co- or level of complexities. Mm. If you have level of complexities like that, how do you coordinate efficiently? Mm. Mm. That is mm. the problem. So I don't think it is the issue. The issue is on why it is so large because of political accommodation. Yes. So this that is, is so about distribution it, of power, right? Mm. And 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 remember, if it is about efficiency, when you when you divide when you divide one ministry, for instance, into several, mm. you need a lot of uh, work to do, right? Mm. You need time at least two years mm. to streamline everything, yep. correct? Right? Mm. To make sure that all set. Yeah, in Malaysia we call it a puncha kuasa. See, yeah. right? You have to make sure you know what you are supposed to be in control right. of. That's number one. Number two, about the money. Hmm. More hmm. structures, more money, hmm. because every ministers from political parties will bring their own political appointees, yes. and so on and so forth. So let's see. But I believe that this is this is more a political accommodation uh, accommodation kind of cabinet rather than more efficient way of doing things. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask just one question. I'll pass it back to to Peter. So. You know, he has this uh, kind of a political balancing act to play. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately, whatever political balancing act he plays still has to go back to certain policy objectives. Yes. And you mentioned uh, the economy and also defense. Mm-hmm. So how do you think he, what kind of approach or what kind of strategy does he have uh, that may be, you know, different or the same or similar to Jokowi? in order to pursue objectives in these two areas? You know, in terms of economy, I'm not an economist. Uh, I was told by our friends in economy, the Indonesian economy is really relying on the consumption. Mm. Mm. And our consumption is really relying on import, mm. uh, like nine basic goods and so on and so forth. Mm. So, so the, the manufacturing base is not that strong yet? Yet, mm. yeah, no, not yet. So I think uh, uh, Prabowo knows that. So you will see that at least at the start of his presidency, he will make sure that the consumption, the the, the policy of import will still be there, so that uh, the the stability of economy can still be uh, managed, mm. right? But at the same time, I think he has a plan to to uh, to create that uh, the so-called hilirisasi. What is it called? Um, uh, like uh, make, making. More yeah, manufacturers yeah, type to localize, of thing, to yes. localize, you know, you yeah, know, like uh, for some of the right. EV components, right. uh, batteries, right. Right. And exactly, like that. exactly. The problem is about the investment. 
yes to maintain the economy as stable as like now you don't need more investment right you, you just keep the economy going like now right now with the level of economic growth of five but you cannot increase the economy the development economy uh, without having more growth yes. therefore Parabowo is planning to have eight percent or seven percent of economic growth but to have seven percent or eight percent of economic growth we need a lot of investment yes. to do that manufacturing policies and so on and so forth mm. the problem is investment is not there yet in Indonesia example the exa- investment for uh, new capital mm. is not there so I think uh, the uh, beside man- managing the stable economy one of the prior the other priorities of, of Joko uh, pra- Prabowo is how to get the investment particularly from the outside world therefore other than so economy defense then international relations will be also another issue that he will be focusing on particularly uh, US and re- China US and China hmm. and also related to US China Singapore hmm. Japan hmm. Australia yeah. yeah that's why he's so keen to want to join BRICS and then at hmm. the same time also apply to join the OECD exactly yeah, yeah. so that kind of balancing act Peter uh, I think you had some questions about you know Prabowo's uh, priorities especially on the economic side yeah, I think uh, for me, generally, number one, I was reading quite some news mm-hmm. and they say that there were a lot of talks about how Prabowo may not want to continue the new capital yeah. project, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it's just going to be there. Yeah. No. And second thing is more about his priorities. So he did talk about that he want to build this seawall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, It's going to cost a lot of money. Some experts are now saying that that's another thing that likely will end up as a white elephant. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and the other one is, yes, he's been talking about uh, food security, import stuff and so on. And mm. he's been talking about this lunch program yeah. that he wants to have as <clears throat> his hallmark thing, right? So some experts are also suggesting that, hey, with that, will it end up becoming something that truly benefits the people? Mm-hmm. Or is it something <clears throat> that that is for more kleptocracy to yep. actually mm-hmm. happen, right? So these are those questions that I have of the internal politics. Yeah. Uh, I definitely have some questions mm. about the foreign politics okay. side, mm-hmm. uh, but we'll go on okay. that later. Okay, um, maybe you heard about the programs called quick wins. So meaning that he will prioritize several immediate things to yeah. do. Low hanging fruit, yeah. Yeah, during this uh, 100 or 200 days. And part of the programs for quick wins is, what is it? To manage the people expectation. And one of the ways to manage that, that, that people's expectations is by showing people that he is, uh, what is it, meeting, meeting the promise, mm. carrying mm. out the promises that he made during the campaign. Menetapi janji. Mm. Menetapi janji. Menepati janji kalau di Indonesia. In ah. Indonesian term, menepati. menepati In Malaysian, menetapi. Mm. Uh, m- 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 you're right. I, I menepati. Menepati. Okay, menepati janji. To uh, keep the promise. To keep the promise. So... Uh, pre-mail is one of the, the issue. There are, I think, seven or eight programs of quick wins. So free mail, and then building, uh, renovating and building school buildings. Free medical checkup for everybody in need. I, I am not, maybe, I, I'm not included in, in that scheme, maybe. Village infrastructures development, mm. like village roads and so on and so forth. Yeah. So all will be his priorities. And all of those things, of course, will take up a lot of uh, current national budget. Mm. Right? Money and also time. Yeah. Money and mm. time. So uh, those, I think, will, uh, I think will be his priority. Uh, but on your second question about the new capital, I think it is related also to the question of, yes, by law, the capital has been set up to be built, but it cannot be built without the money. Mm. Yeah. So I think the rumors about him contemplating about postponing or even cancelling, I think uh, I think it's a legitimate rumor because uh, the main question is why do we pursue that ambitious project only to please Jokowi, right? Yep. So there should be an objective reason to do so and an objective funding for that, mm. and that is the, uh, the I think that is the issue. So you know, a lot of things still in limbo in terms of economy and and program and some programs i think is meant to be only like a rhetorical program like the giant sea wall you mentioned mm. it is not it is not circulating very well even among elites only right. several people uh, uh, are talking about it so it is not i don't think it is considered to be a serious program right. yeah and i i don't think it is part of his official 
platform. Right. So it's something you just blurt out. Yeah, like. yeah. yeah. You know, to please uh, everybody and so on and so forth. So that, that I think, uh, again, as I said, economically speaking, although Jokowi can live a good, stable economy, but in terms of how to move forward with better economic development, Prabowo has a lot of burdens. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because let's say you want to move into a middle-income country first. You don't talk about income yeah. for Indonesia. You have to grow your manufacturing That's base. Right. You have to get to more do. investments, uh, both exactly. foreign and direct. You have to probably have uh, some more uh, deregulation in some mm. sectors so that the private sector can come in a bit more uh, you know, uh, constructively and transparently. And then you, at the same time, you have to do this while watching right. your government finances. Yeah. Right? So not easy to handle. So I just have one last follow-up question mm. to that. Right? Uh, will be... Because there was this pass-off between Jokowi to him, and for Jokowi, that new capital is... Yeah, it's a pride. pride, right? yeah, pride. Uh, yeah. and, and the fact that like he circulates it so widely, such rumour that saying that he may not want to go on with it, mm. will, will that be kind of like the first act of defiant or the first slap in the face mm-hmm, kind of thing mm-hmm, towards mm-hmm. Jokowi and then leads down to, you know, him getting sidelined? Yeah, I think again, yeah, um, there should be now, for it, it is time now for Prabowo to, to set up an objective reason in doing things, in policy, pursue, in, in, in pursuing certain policies and so on and so forth. Yes, I think he should return the favor, politically speaking, or he feel like he, obliged, he is obliged to return some favor, but when that favor will put him into, into political problem, then uh, there you go. You have uh, you have the issue. What is needed by Indonesians in general? The we have do, we have done hundreds of hundreds of national surveys asking people what are the immediate problems that needs to be solved by the current national government. The answer is always the same. So far, one is related to economy, which is the price of the basic goods, the job, and then the infrastructures development. And then that those three very important economic issues, and then uh, then goes several other things like health issues, education, education. Mm. yeah. Then uh, a bit at the very bottom, corruption. Corruption. Nobody is crime. talking about IKN or the the new capital and so on and so forth. Mm. So, I think if by putting too much money on continuing this uh, cent- uh, new capital. It will be jeopardizing the economic priorities, as I mentioned. Then I think Prabowo will take, uh, will will just uh, uh, you know deprioritize. Yeah, deprioritize that 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 uh, uh, capital. So I think it is you know governing is different from camp- campaigning, right? Although governing is also campaigning, but when you are governing, you have to deal with uh, very uh, important uh, real issues. Although there are also some uh, not non-substantive issues, I think Jokowi underst- uh, understands that also. Yeah. So maybe one last final part on this part before we close with some foreign policy, uh, you know, questions. Uh, you know, even while he's building up this coalition, there are moves that I can see where he has also maybe a little bit of going after potential rivals. Yeah. So one example I like to uh, you know discuss with you. Anis Baswedan. Uh, Anis no. too, both. I think Anis, who was uh, who was uh, who ran a, a second mm-hmm. second to him in the presidential yeah. campaign, uh, who, as I know, is also without a party at this point in time, yeah. and also somebody who campaigned quite strongly uh, with Anis, a uh, gentleman by businessman by the name of uh, Tom Lembong. Oh, Tom Lembong. Uh, yeah, who yeah. is uh, who is you know has been charged with yeah. certain corruption charges when he was yeah. uh, minister in 2015 or 2016. Mm-hmm. So uh, I I've met Anis before. I know Tom better because mm. similar kind of background. Mm. So what 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 do you see of these two individuals and the way Prabowo has treated them? Tom Lembong has been very close to Anis mm. during the last let's say five years. Yes. So I think, well, <laughs> politically speaking, you can you can, uh, what is it, charge this event by association, right? Yes, correct. So mm. meaning that... That's that how I would see it yeah, as an outsider. Yeah. Yes. So what happened to Tom Lembong could be considered as a proxy to what will happen to uh, Anis. The former uh, Jakarta governor. Governor, yeah. So it has been the practice in Indonesia, particularly during Jokowi, particularly in during second term of Jokowi, mm. you can defeat your opponent by uh, two things before you really face the opponent in the election. One is 
prevent him to enter the arena hmm. of election. So he cannot contest. He cannot contest. Two, by uh, legal issues. Unfortunately, for many Indonesian politicians, legal issues can be the issues for everybody. Correct. Yes. Right. No, no, no one is. No one can say that they are totally clean. See? <laughs> right. <laughs> See, so uh, I think uh, in that sense, this is a warning, right? A warning to a potential opponent, and that warning has been clearly stated before Anis fail to enter the arena of governor's elections in Jakarta, right? Ducted, everything is pursued by uh, Prabowo's coalition, Prabowo in this case, mm. to prevent Anis to enter the coalition. Mm. To, Why? To prevent him from even being nominated. Exactly. Mm. Why? Be- because there is, a, I think there are two two reasons for that. Why Prabowo is so vehemently uh, uh, trying to prevent Anis to enter the the, the 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 arena of election of Jakarta? Number one is, I think he's not happy with him, hmm. and in many occasions, personally, he said uh, something like this: "Look, somebody give me a grade of eleven out of a hundred hmm. as a minister of defense. Hmm. Who did that, Anis?" Hmm. When Anis was asked, "What is your grade for Prabowo as Minister of Defense?" Anis said, "Eleven." So everybody is surprised. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's very high. Mm-hmm. Then Anis out of hundred. Out of hundred. Oh, okay, okay. Then Prabowo. Yeah, and Prabowo is the type of person who will take this personally. Personally. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's number one. And also, that is only one example. There are many other things that made him mad, really, really mad, uh, with Anis. Number two. He doesn't want Anis to have a good platform to be a threat to him. To, yeah, to 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 launch his uh, second attempt as the presidential candidate for the 2029 uh, election. So, and Jakarta will be a very good platform for, for anybody to run for the presidential election, mm-hmm. like Jokowi mm-hmm. and then Anis, yes. right? And so on and so forth. So I think that is uh, 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 that is one of the reasons. But this could be backfired. Ah, why do you say that? Let's learn from Jokowi. During his reign in Jokowi, the number of people who publicly disapprove Jokowi's uh, job, no matter what, is around 25 to 30 percent. Mm, quite low. Quite low, but i- significant, right? Meaning that there is at least 25 to 30 percent of public opposition ah, okay, okay. against the government. This group needs to be channeled. We are two things at least. One is the official opposition in the parliament. There is none so far, except maybe PDIP. Otherwise, they will channel their opposition, public opposition, via important figures outside Personalities. the government, yes. like Anis. So now Anis has become the so-called vic- political victim. Mm. You know, people are, tend to sympathize, mm. si- to be to put sympathy on uh, on, on the victim, yes. like Anis, like. SBY in 2004 mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So instead of making him weaker, m- making him weaker, instead of you what is it? Making uh, more popular. Removing the good platform for Anis by uh, preventing him to be uh, in the arena of governor's of election is even providing better platform for Anis mm. to run as an inter impo- uh, in, uh, national figure against the government all over Indonesia. Mm-hmm. Let's see though. Let's see, because let because remember, Prabowo is the president. Yes, correct. Right? Yeah, he, has the he is controlling power. the country. Yes. So you see, okay, okay, you have good platform, Anis. Mm. You can go everywhere, mm. but I have the power also. Mm. So right? how how will he right. utilize mm. that platform? Right. That would be very mouth, interesting. Eh? Right. Uh. Yeah, because we also have uh, some similar experiences here <laughs> in Malaysia. <laughs> you know, some of our yeah. leaders. So this thing are very familiar to you, right? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Smaller scale. Smaller scale. Smaller scale. <laughs> more, smaller scale. Yeah. more complex uh, yes. relationship. But yeah, I mean, we'll come back for the last part. Uh, quick, quick one, and we'll uh, talk about uh, you know some geopolitical issues. Be okay. right back. Welcome back, guys, to the last segment where we're going to talk to Jay about geopolitics briefly. Uh, so under President Prabowo, we can see this balancing act that he's mm-hmm. trying to play uh, between the the great rivals, US, China, you know, Europeans, uh, Russians, and whatnot. On the one hand, I can see that this is uh, smart politics, but on the other hand, sometimes I can also see that having some doubts in terms of whether President Prabowo has that discipline and the strategic mm-hmm. thinking. Mm-hmm. 
to be able to manage this balancing yeah. act? What, what, what is your view on this? You know, uh, I believe that Prabowo is very uh, fluent in international relations. Mm. Meaning that he is very confident in meeting with international leaders, not like Jokowi. Let's start with what he believed based on what he stated. Many times, particularly during the campaign, he stated that he quoted the statement from Thucydides. Mm, yes. Uh, the, yes. The realist uh, politics, yes. right? Yep. The strong will do what they want. The weak will suffer what they must. So in a way, it is a belief from him. And elaborating that uh, statement, he said that our nation should be strong. To be strong, we need two things. One is good economy, strong economy, and strong defense. That is what he believed. So if, let's say, he wants to have a more aggressive defense policy, mm. do you think that he would uh, run into some challenges vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, let's say, China? Uh, with a uh, you know more aggressive policy on some of the the naval navigations, mm. for example. Uh, this is my interpretation. His focus is more internal ah, security, okay. mm. because by having good in Indonesian term, it is called national resilience. Mm. Focusing on more internal security, so that you are not easily be defeated by other countries. So to do so, both economy and defense, Prabowo needs a lot of money. Mm. Number one, to have a lot of money investment, he need to have good neighbors. Mm. He need to have a stable uh, region, regional situation in Southeast Asia, regional situation in in the world in 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 general, mm. good relationship with China, good relationship with uh, the U.S., yes. with Singapore, uh, with India, and so on and so forth. Therefore, in his uh, foreign policy talk, he always summarize his foreign policy with simple statement. What we are going to pursue is good neighbor policy. So that is, I think, the, the main, uh, what is it, the main frame that would like to pursue. But I think there are two other things we need to add there. Number one is that, as I said, his approach will be pragmatic, will be pragmatic. Meaning that, well, whichever more beneficial for Indonesia, as long as it is in line with Indonesian national interest, for instance, in this case, national interest in the economy and in, and in defense. What I mean by defense is Prabowo believed that Indonesia needs a very, very massive development in defense uh, because our defense capacity is very low. Our investment in defense is the lowest compared to India, let alone China, in Asia, right? So, but. Uh, Indonesia should be at the level of China and in and, and, and India, or at least India, right? Because of the size of the country as the so-called middle power. Mm -hmm. So those 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 two things, uh, those two things. So in and pursuing that, he needs to the help of big powers, mm -hmm. as well as countries in the in, in in the region. So that that is number one. He will be pragmatic, but there will be uh, some idiosyncratic issue here idiosyncratic mean related to his personality. So you will see his foreign policies will put him more in the spotlight. It is not like Jokowi. For instance, Jokowi never sent, never came to the General Assembly meeting of United Nations. Mm -hmm. Prabowo will be happy to do so. He will travel around the globe to meet international leaders. Sounds familiar. Yeah? Sounds yep, familiar. Yep. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 I know. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> No, so, so yeah, so that can be a positive, but can right, also uh, be yeah, 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 of course, yeah. of course. Yeah. You can get investment from there, but also it is projecting your confidence, your mm. pro probably international leadership kind of mm. thing, right? So that Jokowi did not do, and then uh, that is the so that is in a way substantive issue there, and also uh, idiosyncratic related to uh, Prabowo's personality. The other thing I think is that. There is an element of putting Indonesian international leadership role mm. in the region, mm. particularly Southeast Asia, mm. and in the region of uh, Muslim world. He appoints a foreign minister who is very inexperienced. Mm, yes, but a very good friend of his. <laughs> Maybe not friend. Oh, sorry, a junior. <laughs> Even not junior, okay. personal assistant. Personal assistant, yes. Because okay. according to some analysts, mm. actually, Prabowo has no friends. Ah. He has only, what is it called? Subordinate. Oh, okay. okay. Anak buah. Oh, okay. Anak, anak Makes sense because yes. he's a military guy. Yes. yes. Oh. <laughs> if you are a friend, you will not be in his inner circle. Because once you are in his, in his inner circle, you are no longer friend. You have to be subservient right. to him. Right, mm. right. So, but he appoint also some vice ministers, right? Mm. 
One of them is Anis Mata, the vice minister, who seems to be uh, specifically designed, uh, assigned to deal with Muslim world. Ah, okay. So I think maybe in a way there is some substance in that, but I think it is more rhetorical or more, you know, mm. more uh, like projecting Indonesian role in Indonesian uh, mo in, in Muslim world and also in, 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 in Asia. Yeah, so, so I think those are, you know, on, on paper at least seems to be quite well thought out. Uh, but I'll, I'll just give one example of how I, I saw President Prabowo, at that time he was defense minister, putting out a suggestion that I thought maybe wasn't well, so well... For, for uh, Ukraine? Yes, for Ukraine. Okay. So for, for listeners, this was at the Shangri-La Dialogue mm -hmm. in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was almost as if he gave, he wrote this uh, proposal on a on an envelope mm -hmm, <laughs> where mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where he said okay uh, this is the way in which we can settle the dispute between Ukraine and Russia yep. and and this is my proposal f you know that you you should consider right so you you want to say a bit more about that and why why that may have I, I, I don't I don't remember exactly yeah. the, what, the what proposal, proposal is that? Yeah, so yeah. he basically said that uh, for Ukraine you have to ac accept. Uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. advances that the U that mm -hmm. Russia has yeah, 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 into yeah, your territory, yeah, yeah. right? right. Uh, and and this is the the way in which you're going to get peace. Yeah. And I think uh, the 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 Ukrainian representative who was there uh, came out and said, "Look, <laughs> this is a non-starter. We yeah, won't yeah, accept yeah. it." Right. <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, but but Prof. Kian Wing, that's what I what that's what I'm saying is rhetorical. Oh, okay, okay. But Be but rhetoric sometimes can have. Uh, important uh, consequences in in geopolitics. <laughs> yeah, but but people know that Indonesia is not a big power. Okay, it is an asp an aspirant of middle power, right? Okay. And it has no very strong defense mm. uh, capacity. Mm. The economy is good, but not at the level of you know uh, of middle income country, country yeah. yet. So uh, people know Indonesian capacity. So I think uh, with a good communication skill. It can be managed that oh, this is part of our, you know, projecting our strategy for our domestic, you know, audience. Indonesian mm. domestic audience uh, wanted to have a good and strong leaders internationally. During Ukraine, during Ukraine war, even until today, I don't know why some people can answer that Indonesian public seems to be sympathized more with. Russia. Have you done any polls on this? To some, find out why? some group do, did that. Russia is appreciated more. Mm. Is it because uh, from the perspective of many Indonesians, especially those uh, in, in Java, this is uh, an example of how we shouldn't give too many, too much powers to the provinces. Some of them may break away. Those kind of uh, thinking that, that uh, this will threaten the integrity of uh, Indonesia. For yeah, uh, the, it is part of it. And also the sentiment about America is too powerful, ah, too much, okay. and so on and so forth. Mm. Because mm. when you ask Indonesian people, what countries in Saudi Asia, East Asia, Asia, or in Indonesia are the most powerful one, the most inf uh, influential one? Two countries. One is China, second is the United yes, States. Yes, yes. To China, more negative than United States. But still, when it, when we are talking about international issue, sometimes people think that United is too United States is too much, mm. and especially and over what's happened in uh, Gaza and the Middle right, East. Mm. As well. Right. Yes. So that is that is the 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 uh, the reason uh, I think um, uh, in terms of that uh, policy. So, but again, I think it is more rhetorical, right? Right. Because there is no way Indonesia could implement that kind of proposal. Yes, it's not a serious proposal. Yeah. So, um, but again, um, uh, but uh, one more thing is that uh, if uh, the the, policy, uh, the the foreign policy will be number one pragmatic, there are some substance in it, and also focusing more the Indonesian domestic need in this case uh, economy and defense, but all of those will be at least uh, officially constitutionally frame in a, the, mo, uh, the most important doctrine in Indonesian foreign policy, the politics of bebas active, yes. meaning active that neutrality, active neutrality uh, or whatever you can interpret that. Yeah. So that will be projected by Prabowo as a, as a president and seems to be as a chief diplomat of Indonesia. You can see that and, uh, you know, uh, maybe there's some parallels uh, with uh, Malaysia as well, uh, but that's a separate conversation. Yeah. Any last questions that you want to ask? And Prabowo has a good friend in, in Malaysia, right? Yes, uh, prime our minister. prime minister and him, I think they get along, uh, <laughs> they see things, uh, you know. Uh, I'm just teasing you. <laughs> yeah. Any, any uh, last questions you want to ask? Yeah, I think uh, regarding foreign relations and also investments wise in uh, 
Indonesia. I think it's quite clear that uh, in Indonesia, it's at a state where the internal development is very important, yeah. like infrastructure and mm-hmm. so on. And mm-hmm. I think Jokowi on that end has done a pretty yeah, good job. He's right? right on point and, on that. And yeah. so if Prabowo to just build upon that could lead Indonesia quite well, right? For example, how they've done with the nickel industry where they bring in the processing plants of just exporting raw materials. And I think Indonesia has a lot more that they can do just by replicating a similar policy. However, uh, with that in mind as well, uh, do you think that Prabowo will expand this particular prov- uh, policy to instead of just uh, exporting raw materials, but instead of uh, manufacturing within and then increasing the increasing the connectivity along those big infrastructure lines. And then the next question will be towards you. Lah. If let's say that is being handled very well, how well do you think Indonesia will be a competitor of Malaysia dynamics? Because in a way, Malaysia is also taking the advantage because, I mean, geographically, we are, I would argue that we are slightly more well-placed yes, geographically yes. Mm-hmm. due to the sea lines and everything. Mm. All. And yeah, yeah, with the recent development of China and stuff like that, yeah, we are definitely a little bit more on the benefit side mm. due to placement. But we also have competing industry like our palm oil. Sure. So right? yeah, you answer that yeah. first. Okay. Then, then yeah. yeah, how does Wrap it pose it as a competition? Yeah, I think the plan is there. For instance, a lot of statement about hilirisasi. Hilirisasi basically localization, localizing yeah. the, the the industry. You 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 do, you, do, you are no longer exporting the raw materials like uh, what is it raw materials of nickel and so on and so forth. Instead, you you will be uh, so probably plan to build the industry for battery, for EV, and so on and so forth, right? That is the plan. The other, the other issue uh, is, number one is continuing the infrastructure project. And um, I think, uh, for instance, the, 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 the toll road from the very southern tip of Sumatra all the way to northern part of Sumatra is not there yet. Needs to be uh, uh, connected. connected. So if, that's, if that can be connected, boom, you will have very good connection, good connectivity, and it will be booming the economy. But it takes time, right? The other thing that Prabowo tried to uh, uh, put in his plan is the so-called food estate. Uh, related to uh, geopolitical issue also, but also Indonesian domestic issue, is that the food security. Yeah, food security, yes. But so far, again, this food security has been, you know, failed. Mm, yeah, Malaysia has some experience as yeah. well. Yes. And can you imagine that uh, created thousands and thousands of hectares of, uh, uh, of rice field in Papua, in the very eastern part of Indonesia? Who will manage that, right? For instance, and so on and so forth. So I think if things still continue Jokowi's way, in food estates thing, in localization, localization uh, infrastructure. So, so Indonesia will be very slowly developed into catching up the level of Malaysia. Hmm. So but I, I, we'll yeah. see. So I, I think that that is a good development. Uh, I think the gap between Malaysia and Indonesia is still pretty big. Uh, you know, in terms of our economy, we're still growing uh, at about 4 to 5%. Uh, so I think we can complement Indonesia. Indonesia can complement us. Just like how we, in a way, complement what Singapore is doing as well. As we move up the value chain, um, it will be good if, let's say, we can all move together, but at different speeds. Mm-hmm. So, um, but if, let's say, Indonesia continues to develop more, our human resource policies have to change. Meaning we cannot just rely on cheap Indonesian labor yeah, yeah. for our right. factories, our palm oil estates. You right. know, we right. also have to look at our own industrial uh, structure, our employment structure, and then also... Uh, you know, adjust accordingly. And it would be an adjustment that I think would be good for uh, in Indonesia and Malaysia. So I see things more like a uh, uh, glass half uh, full. Uh, and I think if we, let's say, we can grow the level of the glass together, then it will be a win-win for everyone. Right. This is my last question of both of you, right? I think what we have seen so far hearing the development of Indonesia and reflecting on the development of Malaysia, I came to realize that there is a period in every country where there is a need for the development that will take a while to gestate. Uh. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and sometimes that years could be five years, ten years, right? And there is this importance of a continuation of a leadership. Yeah. But then this becomes a political question also, right? Mm-hmm. Because in order to continue that, that power so that there's a continuation of development, you've got to centralize more power, which comes with its own negative things. And, and we have experienced it in Malaysia as well. 
So uh, I'm just asking on a reflective side, mm. when both of you look at this, right? What are your thoughts about it? Like, because if we centralize the power, you can continue, but at the same time, there's more issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what was the concluding thoughts on this development generally? It depends on what you mean by uh, development. If you uh, if you think about development only in terms of specific program of any president, then uh, it can be changed every time the president change, right? But if we are talking about infrastructure development, mm. new capital, and then defense policy, and then education system, mm. they are all should be continued. Mm. There should be some policy continuity, right? Yeah, right. Regardless of who's right, the president. Right. What the president needs to do is to force his ministries or his minister not to have only a short-sighted policies. Mm. Therefore, I think the vision of, of, of the president needs to do. In Indonesian case, we have been securing or what is uh, safeguarding this kind of with the so-called long-term uh, development planning, which is in the form of the law. So I think that will glue the programs of one president to, uh, to the next. As long as it is done, I think that uh, development will be continued. In the case of Prabowo specifically, to your point, Prabowo has promised to continue the good development of Jokowi. Jokowi. Mm -hmm. So at least, even if we are thinking development as a very specific program of the president, like infrastructures, toll roads, I think it will be continued during Prabowo's presidency. He will add some more nuances mm -hmm. and other specific projects. But things like new capital, if it is too much burden, to, if it, it puts too much burden on uh, his economic planning, for instance, mm -hmm. then it will be at least uh, postponed a little or bit. Or slowed down. So slowed down, at least. Yeah. So I just have one thing to add. Uh, I think if, let's say, you can show that you are able to put in good policies, uh, you will put your successor in a position that if he or she moves away from those good and popular policies the public will the be public ma angry with you yes mm. so i mean that there's a simplistic way of looking at it but i think it has a lot of uh, truth in it so with that thank you so much jay mm. thank for you. all your inputs you. it's been a very enlightening time and i definitely know that you guys would have found out much more about uh, indonesian politics both under former president jokowi and also under the new president president prabowo uh, we wish him health well and uh, we hope that we can continue to be good neighbors. Thank yes. you very much.